So what what do you have to do in clinicals? It's just like um, it's like what a doctor does in residency, kind of. Well, not residency, in, internship, I guess. So we have. <coughs> um, Excuse me. Yeah, I guess every every different discipline within medicine, you go around and you spend a couple weeks there. So you'll spend some time in the ER. You'll spend some time in radiology. So right. In uh, inpatient stuff. Surgery, oncology, yada yada yada, and you just you spend like time in those different areas. And at the end of your, and you're supposed to see patients, and you have a preceptor and and doctors you go around with. So you're basically just doing the hands on. So uh, do you start do you start like the day with grand rounds, and then they assign you patients, or what's the deal? So you're talking about when I'm completely done, or for this next phase? No, I'm, for the for when you're right. doing your clinicals. I mean, do you, like do you show up at the hospital? Yeah. And you're, you go you go with grand rounds. You know, you've got a set of patients that when you're doing grand rounds with, you know, the head physician for that floor, that discipline, um, mm -hmm. you do grand rounds in the morning and then they assign you some patients for the day and you just, you do follow-ups or H&Ps or what? No. So it, this is at least how I gather it. You're basically like attached at the hip to one of the doctors who works in that, in that specific discipline. area yeah. of the hospital, right? So like you go to the ER and, and there's a set of doctors you can sign up with and you just go, oh, I want Dr. Smith. And so you're buddy buddy with him all day long, and so you're going to be doing every single case he does, and you know of course he's going to be like, all right, what do you think it is, or, or like you can take this one, or step back for a second, let me let me do this. Right, so right. It's I mean you really get to see someone doing your job and participate in it as they are, and they get to correct you and and you sure. know let you out and reel you back in and whatnot. So you do that for every single area of the hospital. So you go to surgery, and the doc's like, hey, you know how to suture? All right, cool, you're closing, and they'll they'll yeah. watch. You, you know, screw it up. They'll be like, all right, now you suck. Let me do this, and we'll work on this tomorrow. And so it's going to be pretty cool. It's not just going to be like standing around with my thumb up my ass. That's cool. Yeah. I'm really excited because I haven't been in a hospital for like three years. Well, three years, what am I saying? For like a year and a half now. And I went to visit my buddy. They're actually crazy story. He was in my class, and in February, he found out his wife was pregnant. Wait, hold on. February, it was March, and uh, he started having all. He started having like this abdominal pain. Went to the doctor. They're like, "Oh, you're constipated." He was having like, constipation uh, and then diarrhea like alternately, and finally it got so bad he went back again. And they're like, "Well, we'll do it. We'll do a colonoscopy on you." They go in, and he wakes up in the middle of the of this procedure, and he's like, "There was like ten doctors in the room, and they're all looking like scared shitless." And they're like, "Oh, hold on." And they finish the procedure, and they take him in. And they're like, "Dude, you have a giant tumor." blocking your, your colon right at the, I guess, right past the splenic flexor, so on the left side. Yeah. And they showed him pictures of it, and it's like, we don't know what it is. We've never seen this before. Like, I got the oncologist in here, and he's like, I don't know. It doesn't look like cancer, but, again, I've never seen it before. So they did a biopsy. They sent it off, and it came back, and he's, he's got colon cancer. He's 34 years old, and he's got colon cancer. So what did they stage it as, two, three, four? So what? it was – I asked him, and I think he I think he knew for a while, and he never said it. So I just started guessing, you know, and, and I was like, dude, was it like a 3A? And he's like, yeah. So what happened was um, I think it eventually it went to a, it went to a 4 or like borderline, like right at that border. Right. So had the main tumor, and then he had metabolic activity in two lymph nodes in the retroperitoneal area, so basically back behind. And then so he's got part, this. Go ahead. Yeah, and part of that tumor was actually what they thought was wrapped around a ureter. So they were like, dude, we can't do surgery right away. Like, we would love to be able to just do that, but we can't. So we have to do chemo, and they give him all these other drugs. One stops, um, one stops all new vasculature growth, so... Anywhere that the tumor is or the cancer is, it can't really grow new blood vessels and, and like reach out and metastasize anymore. Right, because they're limiting apoptosis, right? Yeah, pretty much. Right. That's, well, I mean, in a roundabout way, that's what they're yeah. doing. Yeah, okay. Um, so, and the other stuff they gave him, I guess, was just to shrink it. And so he did that. He did that for a while, went back in, had another PET scan. They were like, all right, everything shrank down. You don't have any more activity in the lymph nodes. This is awesome. We're going to do your next round of chemo. And he wakes up one morning with the worst stomach pain of his life, goes in the hospital. It gets, like, so bad he's about to pass out. Uh, they do, I guess they did an ultrasound and, and a CT, and they're like, dude, you just perfed your, um, your colon, so we're going to have to go in and do emergency surgery right now. So they go in and uh, end up having the discussion with the oncologist. And they're like, well, what, what should we do? Like, we're in here right now. We might as well just take the shit out. So they went ahead and took it out. 
And it ended up being like a blessing in disguise because they looked at it again and they found there's no activity in the uh, in the lymph nodes that originally had some in there, and there wasn't even a tumor, or if it was, it was like there was not it was not there anymore around around his ureter, and that was what they were really sketched out about because they're like, right. well, you know, we can't re you can't replace a ureter. It's just yeah. So what are they gonna do with the other kidney, et cetera, et cetera? So that wasn't even there. They took the rest of it out, and now he's recovering. So that's cool. Yeah. So I mean, it, it could be good. It could be bad. The problem is the drug they were giving him that would probably help them out the most is the one that caused this uh, abdominal perforation. So they can't give that to him anymore. So now he's got right. to come off of that. He has to heal up. He's got a col um, colostomy bag in there. He has to wait like a month. They have to, or like two months. They have to do the, um, the reattachment of his colon. Then he's got to he's got to wait again, and then he can start chemo. So it's basically a race against the clock here for him to heal up and get back to a place where he can do chemo again. So, I don't know. We'll see, man. He's a great guy. He's do you know what the, do you what the chemo agent was? I don't. I should have asked him. The, uh, well, I, I just because that's what my dad used to do. I know a lot about this shit. That's why I, I can. Asked. Hold on. No, it's, it's no big deal. Just, oh, you know, all right. Um, Avastin was the name of the stuff that ended up giving him the, the perf. So. Yeah, that's that sounds right. Um, where does he live? Down here in San Antonio. Man, um, fuck, what's the name of that? SWAG, Southwest Oncology Group. Mm. Well, um, he's in the military, so they're they're taking care of it. Yeah, I but guess. if he's if he needs a second opinion, a second opinion, uh -huh. SWAG, Southwest Oncology Group. The dudes down there okay. are fucking genius, and they're at, they're based out of San Antonio, not fucking MD Anderson. Oh, um, okay. They t they tend to be a little more aggressive than MD Anderson. MD Anderson's very protocol driven. Okay. You uh -huh. know, and evidence-based medicine, and sometimes that doesn't work for really aggressive shit. Right, you guys you are, to... yeah, you need guys that are su super proactive and looking at the cutting edge shit. So, and SWAG is one of the designated um, groups that runs NCI trials. Um, oh, so it's not. Cool. It's so you have you have Dana Farber uh, in Boston, you have Fox Chase in Philadelphia, you have Fred Hutchinson in Seattle, you have Hogue in Newport Beach. You have MD Anderson, I think I said that. Um, you have um, Siteman Institute in St. Louis. Um, you have the Cleveland Clinic. There's like seven or eight groups, and SWAG's one of them, that basically mm. are at the top of the list for all NCI trials. Mm. So if he's got problems or wants a second opinion or he's, he's not clear on something, right. I would look at SWAG. Yeah, because he's I in because he's in. You guys are in San Antonio, so yeah, yeah, they're right. I mean, I looked at where they're they're actually based. They're, I think they're fairly close to his house, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, he just, you know, right now I think MD Anderson's handling it, and I guess they're they're not at that they're not at that point yet, or I don't I don't know if they even they're they're wanting to do something. But I'll I'll mention that to him. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, you, you oh, got to understand yeah. when, when you get into Mayo and MD Anderson and you get into, you know, Cornell Special um, Hospital for Surgery in New York and, mm -hmm. you know, they're kind of, or UCLA when you're looking orthopedics and stuff, they're the preeminent groups. The problem with some of that is peop, some of this stuff gets lost in the shuffle because they're so large. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with a team approach to oncology, but sometimes you need the guy. Right. You know, or a smaller group that's just fucking cutting edge. Like, if you get testicular cancer, there's only one guy in the country you go to. That's Dr. Einhorn in, in Indianapolis. That's the guy you go to. Okay. Right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, he, he is the guy that developed all the chemotherapeutic protocols for testicular cancer, period. Wow, okay. He is, he, and everybody, defer, he's like, he's like DeBakey and Cooley for heart surgery, right, in Dallas. <laughs> he's like that they guy, ever, right? Everyone's yeah. like, well, Dr. Einhorn said, blah, blah, blah. So. Yeah, and so everybody defers yeah. to Einhorn because he's the one who has all the funding. He's the one that's got the – he's got the mind wrapped around the problem. He's looking for the different tangential solutions. And mm -hmm. he's an old guy who's seen just a ton of shit, you know. Yeah. He's done this a million times, so he can look at a patient's H&P and all the labs and all the scans and stuff and say, here's what we need to do with you. You mm -hmm. know, if this was, you know – we're looking at we're looking at your 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 blood work and your scans and your biopsies and your your like you said a <coughs> you're a three A so these are your okay. options these are your options for testicular cancer you mm -hmm. know and because you're young 
you know, and you're healthy, we can be more aggressive. If you were older and presented with testicular cancer, which is unusual, right? Yeah, that's, right. It's a young, that's a young man's disease. Um, we would approach right. it this way. And everybody goes, hey, Dr. Einhorn, you know, colleagues will call him up and say, hey, you know, I got this patient. He's like, just fucking send me the, send me the reports. I'll take a look at it and fucking get back to you later today. <coughs> Because he's spent, he's he knows he's not going to be around forever, and he's trying to train these guys so he can spread this legacy of his knowledge, right? Yeah. But that's the mm. guy you go to if you have a problem with testicular cancer. If you have an unusual tumor, you go see Dr. John DePerzio at Siteman in St. Louis. He is in charge of the NCI Cancer Tumor Registry. Period. Mm. He is the when you have an unusual tumor or an a, an asymmetrical presentation. It all gets fucking funneled through NCI back to fucking Siteman. Or if you know the guy, like colleagues will say, hey, John, can you take a look at this? Yeah, fire off the file. I'll take a look at it. He is the guy. So and that's the problem with all medicine. You know, if you have a certain type of orthopedic right. injury, you go to, you know, a certain person. You know, there's some dudes in Colorado that are really good with um, knee uh, uh, surgeries because they see all these skiers, right? Right. And and they're the ones that handle all the Olympic team skiers and soccer players. There's a guy here in Columbia where I live, and he used to be the orthopedic consultant for the women's um, Olympic and World Cup soccer team because he's one of the best mm -hmm. guys at reconstructing knees. You just have to know where to find the guy. That's the problem, right? Right, and you have to have, to have access to him too. Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, I had I had an unusual, you know, period of. Uh, basically daily migraines and it wasn't a migraine it was something unusual pretty rare and it took me six years to find the fucking doctor at st luke's um montefiore um in new york you know and i finally ran into the you know i got an appointment with this guy and he said bring all your shit with you he looked at me <laughs> did didn't ancient people he's like i don't want to because i don't want to duplicate right everything you need to yeah that's bullshit yeah. Right. and and this guy's so hard to get into he either does it pro bono or you pay cash. He doesn't take insurance. Wow. Right. And and because you because I paid cash, the next dude who doesn't have the money gets a pro bono visit. Right. That's when I'm cool with that. That's that's awesome. Yeah. yeah so and, and he's and he's a he's a he's a teacher and stuff, and he's a he's a mentor to a lot of neurologists. And he's like, you don't have what you think you have. You know, the dude in San Francisco who's world class misdiagnosed you i can see why he would do that and the guy you saw at diamond clinic in chicago got that wrong for this reason he goes you have a very unusual very rare type of you know neurological condition and we're going to use indomethacin wow, to, fucking, really? to fucking kill it yeah <laughs> he goes he goes he goes all the ergot you were on and all the opioids oh and God. all the fucking you, and uh, and um oh what's the fuck uh, and, yeah i mean they, they had me on imitrex and all just all I sorts of fucking horse shit and all the other yeah, and yeah, and, and and probably. And, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. he's like, he's like, that was the wrong tool for the type of headache you have. Wow. They missed the diagnosis, and he goes, "They're great physicians, but this is my specialty. You're lucky you came to see me." And if you'd see that's, me first, you, you know huh? that? what? What? They use that out. Yeah, and he that's goes, Th "This will, this will, it'll take you about 18 months to transition off all the weird shit they have you on." You know, yeah. clean clean up your blood plasma levels on the, all this crap, and, and, and yeah. get rid of that crap, and get you down off this shit. And then, because you're taking indomethacin, you have to take Prilosec, and he put me on another GI drug because it just wow. destroys your, it destroys your stomach. I would I would assume so, yeah. Yeah, he's like, you can't take you you can't take this by yourself. You have to take it with yeah, food. Like ibuprofen on crack. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 good shit. He goes, and after about 18 months, you should see some serious relief and. We'll do a maintenance program on this drug for another year, and uh, wow. you should be done with your problem. You know, he goes, if you'd see me first, you wouldn't have had to go through all this shit. Hmm. But you saw other good physicians like Ninny and Smart in Houston, and you know, there there there's some really fucking phenomenal neuro neurologists that deal with headache pain. But if you don't get it right the first time, you go down this wrong path. Right. Because the differential diagnosis was flawed. Yeah, all the stuff on the differential was nothing of what you had. Right, you know, right. and he goes, he goes, you're like one of 49 cases in the United States with what you have. Wow. He goes, so he goes, don't feel bad, and they weren't wrong. They just didn't see what I could yeah. see. They they did what they did. They did what they were trained to do, and they did it the right way. But it just happened to be a zebra instead of a horse. Right. So, so the dude I saw at UCSF in San Francisco, 
is the guy that developed the ergot protocols for uh, migraines. Oh yeah. Right. And his yeah. his ergot drugs were so fine tuned for the individual. You had to go to a special formulary um, uh, place to have them hand grind your right. specific drugs. Right. That's yeah. how that, that's how fine tuned this guy was with your with your um, RX. And um, you know, I took that shit for like six months and didn't see any fucking results, and I'm just I'm fucking miserable. And yeah. <clears throat> anyway, so if you don't find the right guy, you know, you can get some relief and you can get you can see some progress. But you know, sometimes yeah. you, you just you just don't win the lottery that day. And and it's not like people. I try to explain to people with some of this shit. It's so individualized. It's not like it's not like a it's not like a radial fracture in your forearm. You take, you take an image, you set the fucker, you cast it, you do a follow-up four weeks and eight weeks, you take the cast off, you give them some yeah. you know, physical therapy if, if, it's, if it's you know required and needed or it's part of the protocol, and you tell them to you know, be careful, and then they, after another four weeks of PT and careful you know, strength and conditioning, they can go back to activity. It's not that simple. So, yeah, the brain, the brain and the vasculature surrounding it are, are funny things. So I, I get you. Well, I know, I'm, yeah, I know I a real, I know a really phenomenal pain specialist. He's like, we still understand how pain works. You know, he goes, we don't, we don't understand. Yeah. I mean, we understand some concepts of it, but right. the whole holistic, organic, you know, picture. He goes, yeah, because he was the uh, head of the uh, um, uh, chronic pain specialist um, protocol that was done through. <coughs> NIH of Bethesda. He was one of the te uh, ten guys on the panel mm -hmm. that that was trying to rewrite protocols how to deal with chronic pain. So like chronic bone pain, um, cancer pain, people that have wicked burns, crush injuries, right. phantom limb pain, shit like that. Right. And uh, you know he's like, it's hard because as an individual, pain is subjective. And so when I'm doing you know a DX on somebody based on my differential diagnosis from all their scans and the H and P and shit, there's so many variables when it comes to pain and it's so subjective. It's hard for me to, you know, dial people in. It takes a period of time. It's like psychiatric drugs. They take some time. And the first approach you take may not be the one that works. You may have to dial them off that drug and bring them up on a new drug to get them to the point where they're seeing some relief and some, you know, advancement. And people are like, well, can't they just give you, you know, an SSRI? No, because this is how you're presenting in your physical, you know.